Thanks, Beth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jordan Boyd, chair of the Calgary Weitzman League, and I'm here with Weitzman League's Jordan Maggotson. On behalf of Weitzman Canada, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here this afternoon. As some of you know, the Weitzman League is the young professionals group at Weitzman Canada. A passion for scientific discovery is what the Weitzman community is all about. For those of you unfamiliar with Weitzman, the Institute has an over 70 year history at the forefront of discovery. Since 1964, Weitzman Canada has been helping fuel these critical discoveries. Weitzman most recently ranked eighth in the world for research quality in the prestigious Leiden University ranking, the only non-American institute to rank in the top 10 among the likes of Harvard, Princeton, and MIT. Part of Weitzman's reputation is built by challenging current thinking which has led to life-changing breakthroughs. And if the current pandemic has taught us anything, it's that science is the key to a better tomorrow for all of humanity. That's because science knows no borders. Similarly, Weitzman research transcends borders and reaches us every day in Canada. Since 2019, Weitzman has co-published more than 80 studies with more than 30 Canadian organizations, including 33 studies with eight organizations in Western Canada on topics ranging from the environment to therapeutic discoveries. Before I introduce our speaker, just a few housekeeping points. Your devices will all be muted for the balance of the presentation. Once we're done with the presentation, feel free to unmute yourself to ask any questions during the Q&A portion that Jordan Maggotson will be moderating in about 20 minutes time. Alternatively, you can also type your questions in the Zoom chat. We're here today because there is hope and it is rooted in science, like the vital research being done by Professor Igor Ulitsky. Rather than read Professor Ulitsky's bio to you, we simply asked him to provide his top three achievements as it relates to his presentation today. Here's what he said. Number one, discovery and characterization of long non-coding RNA molecules that are prevalent in the human genome and carry out diverse functions. Number two, showing that long non-coding RNAs play important roles in regeneration of neurons. And number three, showing that targeting and inhibiting a specific long non-coding RNA can have beneficial effects in a genetic form of epilepsy. And given that RNA now seems to be a household term with the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, we're very excited to have you here today, Igor, to explore what these accomplishments mean and how RNA will impact future treatments around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Igor Ulitsky. Thank you, Jordan, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for, for connecting. And it's good good morning, I guess, to you, and good, good evening here, here in Israel. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, RNA, but I'm going to be talking about RNA in the context of, of course, what interests us all today, which is the coronavirus uh, pandemic, and specifically the RNA vaccines. So I'll try to keep it relatively short and focused, and explain a bit about how we got to this point in terms of having these uh, RNA-based vaccines. And at the end, talk a bit about sort of what we can expect from RNA therapies in the future. And most of the time we'll leave for, for your questions, which can be about really about anything. So we know from, from, from history, if we look at the, the past century or so, that vaccines had a dramatic uh, um, effect on our ability to combat infectious diseases. So this is uh, from Science Magazine from a couple of months back. And these are different diseases that the human race had to deal with over the past century. And the size of the circles here is how many people were infected in any given year by this disease. And the colored circles indicate the points where a vaccine was introduced. And we can see that for a variety of different infectious diseases, with the introduction of vaccine, our, uh, our humans were able to um, drastically reduce the burden of the disease in many cases, like polio, I guess, being most celebrated, we could completely eradicate uh, the disease from the face of the earth. So vaccines are important. And of course, there are a lot of hopes that vaccines are going to make an impact on uh, the coronavirus pandemic as well. And I think we can all say now, looking a year back, that we're all quite pleasantly surprised that that actually happened and, and happened as effectively as we've been witnessing in the world over the past uh, several months. So vaccination, in general, all the vaccines, the childhood vaccines, these new uh, coronavirus vaccines, they are all based on the same principle. And the principle is that there is an introduction of an element uh, to our body, 
that element is recognized by the immune system, the immune system is learning different aspects of that element of the vaccine and activates various arms of the immune response. Later on, when we are um, infected with the same uh, virus or, or, or the same pathogen, our system already, our immune system is already familiar with it. It is able to activate these different arms of immunity and to uh, either prevent us completely from being sick or to make the illness much, much lighter because the uh, virus or, or some other pathogen are no longer new. So this, is, this is principle is shared by all the vaccines, including these new vaccines. And it's typically based on an element which is found within the virus and typically an element which is found somewhere on the outer surface of the virus. In the case of the coronavirus, there is one sort of main suspect and main element that all the vaccines that have been developed are targeting. This is the so-called spike protein. So this is the coronavirus. It kind of looks like a crown. That's why, hence the name Corona. There are a variety of different coronaviruses and they all look uh, kind of like this. So these are the spike proteins and specifically on the, on the, the tip of these spike proteins, there is the so-called receptor binding domain. This, this is the tip that most of the vaccines are developed to uh, make our body learn and recognize uh, for, the, for the future. And so what we would like is to introduce this spike protein into the body of the people that are getting vaccinated. And when scientists are thinking about how to develop different vaccines, they are all using the same blueprint, the so-called central dogma of molecular biology. And that is that in our body, we have genetic information stored in the form of DNA. So DNA is the same in all the cells in our body. And it contains a variety of instructions for producing proteins. It is, this is how our bodies work. This is how uh, all other animals, plants, uh, bacteria, and so on. Do. In all cases, the DNA can be uh, converted in a process called transcription into an RNA molecule, which is an intermediate molecule, which is not very stable and only lasts typically for a few hours. And in our body, there is in our cells, there is a machinery which can take this RNA molecule and translate it into a protein. So when the different um, companies and bodies that are working on vaccines are trying to introduce into the body this spike protein, basically they have three basic entry points that they can use. And, and, the, and these entry points are the basis for the different types of, of, of uh, COVID-19 vaccines which have been developed. And, and these can be divided into four groups. So the first one is the one which is most reminiscent of the, the traditional childhood vaccines that we, we all received. The majority of childhood vaccines are so-called attenuated viruses. So the idea is that one can take the virus, treat it with different chemicals, that are gonna make it either completely harmless or severely reduce its ability to cause any kind of effects in the body. But nevertheless, the virus is still going to have all of its components, it's still gonna have all of its spike proteins. The body is gonna recognize this. And this is why many childhood vaccines are effective on one hand. On the other hand, this technology is a bit tricky. It's not always, um, this inactivation can sometimes be potentially irreversible. It is quite difficult to develop, as you can imagine, the company needs to work with the live virus. And as a result, most companies in the West, in, in Europe or in the US, have not taken this route. The, also, this route is typically slower for development of new vaccines. But nevertheless, there are a number of vaccines used in the world, mostly those made in, in China and in India, that are based on this principle. A different idea, which has been, uh, which we heard a lot about in, uh, in the past year or so, is instead of using a coronavirus-based vaccine, coronavirus, again, is complicated to work with, there is some concern that it might not be fully inactivated and so on, is to use a different viral vector. So instead, take a different virus, and most companies use an approach called adenovirus, a virus that typically causes a very mild disease, and within that virus, insert a component that is going, a DNA component that is going to be in the infected cell, in the uh, vaccinated cells, produce an RNA that's going to produce a protein, and this protein is going to be the coronavirus spike protein. So instead of using the whole virus, just take that bit of DNA that is making a, a, the a spike protein and use that in a context of a virus that is I, I, otherwise harmless or almost completely harmless. And this is the principle which was used by um, the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine, which is used quite a, a, a lot in many different places in the world, by the Sputnik vaccine developed by Russia, also used in Russia and many other places, by one of the Chinese companies, 
and by Johnson and John Johnson in the US. So all of these vaccines have now been improved and are quite widely used. And in, in, in the next slide, I'll go a bit into what are the relative advantages. I'll mention that in Israel, also the Israel Biological Institute have been developing also a vaccine using a related principle. That vaccine has not finished testing and not, not been approved yet. The third principle, and this is a relatively new approach, is instead of relying on elements that are gonna introduce DNA into our body, to instead skip this step. Do not provide DNA, but instead skip already to the next step and provide with an RNA molecule, which is gonna contain information for production of the spike protein. And this idea, as I'll mention a bit later, is, is newer, but has been in sort of baking for quite some time now. And this idea was used by a company in the US called Moderna, and by a company in Germany called BioNTech that very early on partnered with Pfizer, which is a very big pharmaceutical company. And these vaccines eventually were the first ones to be approved and also the ones that were used the most in, in many places in the world, including in Israel, I guess, in Canada. The fourth option is to skip this, all this uh, genetic material step altogether and instead to introduce into the body already the protein product of, uh, uh, of the spike. Uh, the challenge in, in this approach is that if we just inject a protein into our bloodstream, uh, the immune system is not going to immediately recognize it as something that it should learn because we're encountering new proteins all the time in our diet, in, in the, when we get infected and so on. So the uh, protein needs to be in a particular form. It needs to be uh, attached to different elements that are going to stimulate the immune system. So this is a bit more challenging. Nevertheless, there is one company, a US company, a relatively small one called Novavax, that recently completed and published its phase three, and it's soon going to be improved. And there were several other related vaccines that are in development. And these are just the ones that we heard the most about in the news, but I will mention that there is a variety of other vaccines that are in development in many different places in the world. I mentioned the one Israeli vaccine as well, but they're also all based on the same principle. So they're all targeting the spike protein, and they're all based on using either the DNA step or the RNA step or the protein, or relying on different inactivated or weakened viruses. It's not clear how many of these vaccines are going to actually make it to a point where they're going to be widely tested or going to be approved. But again, there is, in principle, there, may, there are many others. And if you would have asked me maybe nine months ago, the thought was that the first vaccines that are going to be approved, they might not be so good. And then these, the ones that are coming afterwards, they might be dramatically better. To our surprise, the vaccines that were uh, approved first turned out to be, so far at least, knock on wood, quite effective. So it's not clear that the world really needs uh, uh, additional vaccines to be approved. So if we compare these different technologies, they're very different and each of them has its own advantages and disadvantages. So the attenuated virus, again, this is the one which is a bit tricky, but the, mo the most traditional. So most of the childhood vaccines, the, some vaccines that we're giving to newborns, are based on this principle. It has been mainly developed by Chinese and uh, uh, Indian or organizations. And because it wasn't tested in the West, it's a bit difficult to compare its efficacy to all the other vaccines that we hear about and, and use in Canada or in Israel and so on. But there are varying reports, again, depending on different countries, and it's very difficult to compare reports from different places in, uh, in the world. But the efficacy seems to be quite good, but again, there are varying reports. Because also this is mainly developed by, uh, by two large Chinese organizations, it's not really clear, at least I couldn't at the time find clear information on how much it actually costs per dose, but these don't seem to be very cheap and, and because their production, again, is quite complicated, but they can be produced at quite a high scale, they can be stored quite easily, in principle they can be used uh, for additional uh, boosts and so on quite effectively. So these vaccines, again, have some advantages, but this route wasn't really followed by any companies uh, in the West. The second route, which, which was followed a lot, is instead of relying on an attenuated coronavirus to use a different vector, the adenovirus is the vector that became very popular. This also sounds more traditional. In practice, it's not so traditional because the use of adenovirus was only first approved in 2020 for Ebola vaccines, but it does mean that there was some track record and some testing of these vaccines in the past. These vaccines seem quite effective, again, depending on the place in the world they're tested, on the time they were tested, they appear to be less effective to some extent than the RNA vaccines I'm going to introduce less, but nevertheless quite good. They have some documented side effects. The one you may have heard a lot of in the news was this rare form of a, of a blood disease. Again, very rare, but more of a concern for mostly for young adults. 
The big advantage of these vaccines is that they can produce at a very large scale. So billions of doses of these <coughs> can be produced already and have been produced already. And they are dramatically cheaper than, than many other vaccines. So if you think about vaccinating a major portion of the human population, especially in countries that are not so rich, these are th the kind of vaccines that the world really needs. Also, they're relatively easy to store. They have a disadvantage in their repeat administration. So I'll just briefly mention that the problem here is that when we're using adenovirus as part of the vaccine, our body is developing antibodies to the spike protein, which is what we want, but it's also developing antibodies to this adenovirus. So the adenovirus has its own capsid, its own proteins, and our body is also learning that capsid. So the next time that the same vaccine is used, then the immune response is going to be less effective because part of it is already going to recognize the package in which this uh, um, uh, instructions for making the spike protein were delivered. And then if we use it for a third time, it's probably going to be very ineffective. The different companies use different tricks to overcome this. For example, the Russian Sputnik vaccine is using two different types of adenovirus. Johnson & Johnson are using only, only a single dose, but this is one potential caveat with this approach. If we need a third booster, it's gonna to have to be uh, probably using a different technology. But again, the advantages here are very large scale of production and it's relatively much more accessible. The third technology are the RNA vaccines. Again, this, this was new. This has been in development for some time, but there weren't any approved RNA vaccines before the, the uh, COVID-19 vaccines. These turned out to be very effective. Again, quite surprisingly, if you, a year ago, I don't think uh, somebody could have predicted that there's gonna be this gap, but these RNA vaccines do appear to be the most effective tool that we have so far. They don't have any major uh, side effects. They're not uh, short term. They are relatively expensive. And because this is a new technology, they're somewhat more tricky to produce. So in terms of global uh, production, this is not a vaccine that at least for now can be produced in a high enough scale to vaccinate the whole world in, in, in the coming year. They have more uh, complicated storage requirements, even though those are improving all the time. So at first it was thought that they have to be stored at minus 80 degrees, which is a major problem in many places. Now we know that they can stay stable for uh, quite some time in the freezer or even in the fridge. But again, they're less uh, easy to work with in a sense compared to the other technologies. And the fourth are these protein-based vaccines. Again, they're skipping many of the more tricky steps. This is on one hand, a traditional approach because there are some childhood vaccines that are protein vaccines. But on the other hand, because this is more complicated to, to make the protein in the context that the immune system is actually going to recognize, the companies that are actually developing these are using some relatively new technologies. And what we have seen in the past few months is that they have some production issues. So one of the reasons that, that Novavax hasn't been approved yet is because, because they had some problems scaling up this uh, technology to produce a high enough number of vaccines. But for now, it seems that this might be kind of the technology of the future. So if we imagine additional boosting uh, vaccinations, this has many advantages. It's, it's not as expensive. Uh, production, once it's streamlined, can be a quite, a high, quite a high scale. There are no major side effects and also um, um, it can be kept at reasonable temperatures. So, um, so one, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and sort of talk, talk a bit about sort of why, why do we think that this is a, a why can we be confident in these RNA vaccines? So one common concern is that this is a relatively new technology, right? So th there have been, been any RNA vaccines that have been uh, approved today. And the major reason is, is that it, it took the field a, a, a while to, to figure out all the different aspects of the production and how this RNA needs to be made. And when Moderna started about 10 years ago, developing different uh, 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 vaccine technologies, it was mainly focusing on different diseases where traditionally it has been difficult to develop a vaccine. So as a result, for some of the diseases that they're, they're, they're targeting, either it is difficult to find enough people that are gonna be infected or it's difficult to, or the people need to be followed for uh, long periods of time and so on. So um, th that's why there haven't been sort of um, an opportunity to test these RNA vaccines properly before the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. And then suddenly there was a lot of interest and a lot of uh, incentive to develop vaccines and, and all the advantages of the RNA technology could be used. 
Nevertheless, Moderna has tested a number of different uh, RNA vaccines over the past decade. So there have been people who were uh, inoculated with these vaccines over the past uh, decade, a few thousands of people. But today already we have uh, people who are followed at least a year. So the participants of the first trials of Pfizer and Moderna have been followed quite some time. And of course, today we are also at a point where hundreds of millions of people have been already uh, um, inoculated with these RNA vaccines without any major side effects. And side effects in vaccines typically appear within the first six weeks, two months, something like that. So, so that's why we have in generally uh, have a good confidence and, and sort of, again, we're as a field generally sort of pleasantly surprised at both how safe these vaccines appear to be so far and how effective they are. Um, so another thing that's, that's worth mentioning, I should go back to sharing for just uh, two more minutes, is sort of another concern was, so why was this developed and approved eventually so fast? And the major reason is that um, usually vaccine development is something that process is relatively slow, because as I mentioned, we have, if we think about human population, we have a variety of diseases where we have already developed vaccines, and these are typically quite effective, and, and, and there is no incentive to make a new vaccine for a, a disease for which there is already a vaccine. And we have a different set of diseases like uh, the flu or um, CMV or HIV, where so far we haven't been so successful in creating a vaccine. So typically when companies are, are going about developing vaccines for diseases which haven't, where success has not been met so far, they're typically very careful. They go through phases one at a time, they analyze for a long time the results of one phase before they decide to invest a massive amount of money that uh, is required for conducting testing in tens of thousands of individuals. In this case, money was not so much of a problem because a variety of different organizations, including the US government, have invested a lot of money and sort of told these companies, you can go ahead and, and continue the phases without worrying about how much it is going to cost. Again, particularly in the case of RNA vaccines, these have already been in development for some time. They are relatively very easy to design. Production is also not a major problem. So they could be tested and shown to be very effective and safe in a relatively short period of time. As we have seen first in the trials and in the real world in Israel and, and more recently in the, in the UK, in Europe, in Canada, in the US, vaccines appear to be very effective and can dramatically reduce the load of people who get infected with the disease. They also reduce the transmission between individuals, hospitalizations and deaths have sort of, again, plummeted in, in many parts of the world over the past few months. And again, sort of, if we, if we just, um, I'm gonna sort of stop sharing again. So if you go through the, um, the common concerns and, and I'm just gonna name these briefly and then I'm sure that you also have questions that I can address. So there have been some concerns about fertility that have been raised. And um, so far, again, there, is, there, there are many people who have been uh, vaccinated who got pregnant, who delivered so far, there doesn't seem to be any effect on, um, on pregnancy or on, on fertility. We know that the virus, on the other hand, does have uh, adverse effects related to that. Um, there were some concerns in, initially about sort of whether it's gonna affect breastfeeding, at least for RNA vaccines, we know that the RNA is not found in the, in, in the milk. It doesn't appear to pass. Uh, um, and so um, on the other hand, the antibodies that are generated in the uh, mothers that are vaccinated do pass to the, to the newborns, that they're passed through uh, breast milk. So the advantages go through, there is again, no, no known concern about anything else that goes through. There was a concern about, about allergies for that as well. There are now uh, millions of people that have been uh, um, uh, vaccinated. And while there are some very rare effects, these effects are very rare. So they are typically something like 10 in a million, more or less the chances of being uh, hit by lightning over the course of the year, that's more or less the chances that somebody is gonna have a major uh, allergic reaction. Um, another concern that, that still remains in some cases are, is for individuals who have a particular pre-existing condition that is relatively rare. So these are obviously not enrolled in the trials. So the people who get enrolled in trials are typically ones that don't have any sort of uh, uh, concerns or pre-existing conditions. But again, so far in, in large number of people who were um, um, uh, vaccinated, except for some individuals who have uh, in some form of immunosuppression. So the vaccine in these cases might not be very effective. In other cases, there haven't been any uh, major uh, reasons for concern. And sort of just to briefly again mention, so 
as an RNA biologist and as and, and others who have been sort of thinking about using RNA as a target or as a, as a potential therapy, there's of course a lot of excitement. But now that we see that uh, RNA can be uh, so effective when used in, as a vaccine, to use it in other cases as well. So one scenario where RNA can be attractive is when an individual has a mutation and as a result does not produce a particular type of protein. So in some cases, it's possible to introduce that protein directly. And in some cases, it's possible to introduce the DNA, but of course, RNA has many advantages. And if it would be uh, possible to efficiently introduce it into a, a particular tissue and to, um, a, we see that it can be tolerated quite well. There is a lot of uh, excitement about using RNA for other diseases as well. Um, so I think I'll end here and I'll be happy to take questions again about any, any aspect of this. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Professor Yalitsky, for your wonderful presentation and for the important research that you're doing at the Weizmann Institute. Um, something that just strikes me about your presentation is how lucky uh, we all are to be living in this era of scientific advancement um, and research and uh, progress and compared to previous generations that have come before us and have had to deal with pandemics, we, we now have an answer uh, to that. And it sounds like from your presentation that we hit a huge run, home run with these mRNA vaccines just at the right time. So that's terrific. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to diving in more. And folks, we've now arrived at the Q&A portion of the event. So I'd ask you, if you have questions, um, please use the raise your hand function uh, in Zoom. You can find it under the uh, reactions button and I'd be pleased to call on you to ask a question. You can unmute yourself and ask a question. Alternatively, um, if you'd prefer, uh, you can submit questions through the chat and I'm happy to pass those on to Professor Yulitsky on your behalf. Um, while I give folks a moment to get organized with questions, um, I, will, I, I will go ahead and ask one myself. Uh, Professor Yuliski, I'm, I'm curious of the two mRNA vaccines that are most prominent here in Canada, Pfizer and Moderna. Are you able to comment on some of the differences between them? So we don't know of any real differences. So both of these companies are, so they are, obviously the vaccines are not exactly the same. So the RNA vaccines are quite simple in that they have basically two components. So one component is the RNA molecule. And that RNA molecule is almost the same as the RNA molecules that are used within our cells in our body to produce proteins. But they have one type of modification. And, but this modification is shared by both of the vaccines. And this is uh, what, what is used to avoid. So our immune system in general um, doesn't like to see RNA, sort of foreign RNA around, because there are many RNA viruses. In fact, the coronavirus is an RNA virus. So our, our system has um, various defenses that once it recognizes as foreign RNA are generally triggered. But um, about 15 years ago, one of the sort of key discoveries that really sort of pushed this field uh, forward, and it's probably going to get the Nobel Prize in, in, in the next couple of years, was that one particular uh, part of this RNA can be modified and then the immune system does no longer recognize just the RNA as something problematic. But this change is, is used in both Moderna and Pfizer. There's in fact a third company, a German company called CureVac that did not use this modification and they just published their results this week and, and these vaccines seem to be much less effective. So their effectiveness is only about 50%. Um, the other component of the vaccine is this fatty layer that is encapsulating the RNA and protecting it. This is also slightly variable between what Moderna is using and Pfizer is using, but um, so far there haven't been any, uh, any evidence for any differences, but it's also a bit difficult to compare them. So just, just as an example, now a concern in Israel, and I'm sure elsewhere as well, is that it's now possible to vaccinate children that are between 12 and 15 years old. And in them and in young adults in general, there is a, 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 some condition called myocarditis, so an inflammation of the heart, this is very rare, but does occur. So if we look at the statistics for myocarditis, there is some difference between Moderna and Pfizer. In one, at least in the US, one of them, I think it's 20 cases in a million, and the other one is five in a million. So on one hand, you can say, okay, maybe Moderna is a bit worse, 
But on the other hand, because both in the US and, and elsewhere, these were not really used interchangeably. So some regions or some age groups were more likely to get Moderna, others were more likely to get Pfizer. It becomes very difficult to, to, to actually compare them. But, but, but except for these sort of minor differences and some things that are very rare, we don't know of any, any difference between them, which is not very surprising because conceptually, these are, are very similar and again, quite different from AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson. So. Great, thank you so much. I think uh, we're still waiting for some questions to come in. So I will, I I will go I, ahead and- I, I'm just gonna ask a question on that. I don't have a, I only have a clapping hand. I don't have a raising hand. So I'm just gonna- Oh, no, no problem, just, sure, please go ahead. <laughs> thanks. Um, just on the, to continue on the same topic, Igor, we now in Canada are uh, in, a, in a Pfizer shortage. So people who have received one dose of Pfizer are now being uh, given their second dose of Moderna. And I noticed, I read this morning that a lot of people are canceling appointments because they wanna wait for Pfizer because they want two of the same brand. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, so, so as far as, as we know, there is, so the only reason not to do that is because that hasn't really been sort of tested in the trials, even though I think in the UK, there have been some of these mix and match trials. But again, conceptually, it's the same vaccine. People uh, in, in the UK in particular, people have given sort of changed the dosing regime in general. Right? So in trials, people have waited for three weeks, then countries like UK and more recently Germany and many other places in Europe said, okay, we're changing that. We're giving one dose and then waiting and also in Germany, there has been a lot of cases where they, they initially they would give AstraZeneca to people, but then they became concerned about AstraZeneca. So they would give AstraZeneca first and Pfizer a second. And again, there haven't been any reports on any, or any problems with that, which, which makes sense because as far as our immune system is concerned, it doesn't know that the first dose was Pfizer and the second dose is Moderna. And even if, if the, the vaccines are drastically different, eventually, what the immune system is seeing is that it saw the one the spike protein once in the first dose, and now it's seeing the spike protein again in the second dose. And because it's the second dose and it's already something familiar to it, it is mounting a much stronger immune response. So again, conceptually, um, there there shouldn't be any difference. This has happened in the world quite a lot that that uh, there was a mixing of different uh, vaccine types or or longer intervals, uh, and so far I think both relate to this, but also to other aspects. There, there hasn't been surprises sort of in terms of the understanding that of what immunologists were saying sort of early on. So in this case, conceptually, this shouldn't be a problem. In particular, Pfizer and Moderna are very similar, but also any type of other uh, uh, vaccine is fine. And as I mentioned, I think that if, we, if, if there is a need for another booster shot in a year, um, in it, it's very well could be that this is going to be some other type of like a protein-based vaccine or something that is has its, its advantages. And again, this shouldn't be any problem because our body only cares about the spike protein that's being produced. Thank you, Professor Yelitsky. Um, I understand Ellen Magidson has a question. So will COVID Ellen, yes, will COVID vaccines be a yearly reality? So that's a very good question. So so early on, uh, scientists were really not sure how long the the immune response is going to last, and and the reason is that that we know that for 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 different diseases really have a variability in how long the reaction lasts. Like we get our chickenpox vaccines when we're young, and this lasts a lifetime. But tetanus, we get uh, once, and then after every seven or 10 years, we need to renew it. And for coronaviruses, there was a concern that this is going to be short lasting because, as I mentioned, sort of this COVID 19 is not the only coronavirus. So there are other coronaviruses, including ones that give us a common cold. So not all common cold is coronaviruses, but some of it is. And we get common cold all the time. So, so we get kind of infected with these uh, coronaviruses on average every three years or so. And so flu, we also get all the time, but, but the flu virus changes a lot. So the thought is that we get the flu every year because every time the flu is a bit different. So, so it changes, but these coronaviruses, they don't change so much. So, so the thought was 
and there was some evidence that, that the antibody response that builds up, it, it, it's going to be effective for a while, but then it's going to start uh, fading away quite rapidly. But, but so far, we're not seeing that very much. So, so far, it seems that especially people who are, um, so what, those that are recovering or those that are recovering and got a single dose, they, some of these can now be followed for quite some time. And their antibody levels and their immune response still seems to be uh, uh, quite effective. But we don't know how long that's going to last. And, and another point related to that is that um, there was, there, again, in some, in some types of flu, it was seen that if, if you give two doses and then you wait for six months and you give a third dose, then you get a dramatically higher level of antibody. So this is kind of, if you wait for, for half a year, and um, the third dose is, is really very dramatically more effective. So, so Pfizer and, and Moderna, they just finished this kind of trial. They would give it a couple of doses and wait for six months. And there does seem to be some benefit, but it doesn't seem to be a, a real game changer to wait for six months. And um, so sort of the, the, the short answer is that, that scientists and these companies, they don't really know how long it's going, it's going to last. But because these viruses in general don't change so fast, and because so far the immune response seems to be quite robust, um, it doesn't seem like this is something that is going to happen every year. Again, it's, it's, it's different from the flu, where the flu is just changing uh, uh, much, much more rapidly. It's still possible. And in many cases, in terms of sort of public health management and, and politics, it's, it's helpful. To, uh, people want to make sure that there is enough uh, vaccine supply and so on, but, but for, so far everything has been quite optimistic and it does seem that the response lasts for quite some time. Again, there might be a need for another booster shot um, maybe in early 2022, but, but only once we see that the immunity is, re is really waning. There is no sign of that so far. That's great. Yeah. And it looks like Ellen just has a follow up to that. Is it possible to create vaccines tailored for people who are immune compromised, such as frail elderly or cancer patients? Yeah. So, uh, so that's in general. Um, um, so I'll, I'll have a two part answer. So, on one hand, in terms as far as vaccines are concerned, then this is a problem because uh, the vaccine is the principle is really we're introducing something very, very small to the body. And then the immune system is doing everything else. So we really need a functional immune system to make up all this vaccine uh, response because eventually the vaccine itself is really a very tiny, uh, tiny component. And sort of, again, another piece of positive news has been that the, the vaccines that we have seem to be quite effective in the elderly as well. So, so the flu shots, their effectiveness in, in, in I think above people who are above 60, above 70, they're, they're effective is something like 30%. It's really not, not that great. And in this case, we see that effectiveness drops a bit, but they're still very effective in, in, in elderly population as well. Uh, but on the other hand, there are other types of therapies, such the, as the antibody uh, uh, therapy, which is what sort of US President Trump got when he was sick, uh, which is basically, that is a kind of an alternative tool that can be used. So if you have an individual who is at risk, if that treatment is given very early on, an antibody treatment that can in many ways kind of replace the, the vaccine. And also there are many efforts, including here at the Weizmann, there is a big international effort to develop drugs that are gonna target coronaviruses. And there has been, some pro this always takes much longer, but there has been some very exciting progress in that. So that is also something that ideally is gonna be effective. You'll need to take it very sort of very early on. Like you think you're exposed, you take a pill and this pill, pill protects you. And again, if, if it's a bit later, then antibody treatments are, are effective. So these are all things that are going to kind of replace the need for antibodies. Perfect. Thanks, Professor Yelitsky. I've got a question here from Jordan Boyd. He'd like to know, are there specific examples of conditions that may be resolved by using mRNA vaccines in the future? Right. So, so that, that's a great question. So, um, so we can look at sort of what kind of things Moderna and other companies have been, been developing. And as I mentioned earlier on, these are mainly uh, conditions where there aren't effective vaccines today. So, so one great example is, uh, is CMV. So CMV is a disease that you typically don't hear about unless you're, you're pregnant. 
And this is a virus that infects most of the human population. And usually it's completely, it's either feels like a cold or, or you don't even feel it. But if you're pregnant and you get CMV, then it's, this can be uh, dangerous for, for the newborn. Uh, so that's why typically women, as they get pregnant, they get tested for CMV. And if they're, they're negative, they should be careful and, and so on. And this is an example of a condition where there have been attempts to develop a CMV vaccine, but they haven't been successful so far. And in this case, Moderna, they have a CMV vaccine that's now entering phase three and it looks promising. So this is a condition where hopefully this is gonna work, but it's also an example of something of why it's difficult to test these vaccines when there isn't a pandemic. So CMV is something you get once in a lifetime. So to test this vaccine, you need to give it to several tens of thousands of people and then wait long enough time that something is gonna to happen to them that typically happens once in a lifetime. So this trial is gonna run for three years. But, but other conditions are, are sort of HIV. There is still also a lot of hope for an HIV vaccine and cancer. So individuals who have cancer, there is a lot of sort of progress in immunotherapy in the past, uh, past decade or so, but still there is a lot of desire to develop vaccines that are gonna be tailored to an individual. So if an individual has cancer, in many cases, they would have a mutation. So that means that they are producing some protein that is really different than the body's own proteins. But, and that the immune system in principle can recognize and it can attack the tumor if only it can be stimulated to actually uh, make that happen. So what BioNTech, which is the company that developed the other vaccine, has been mostly focused on and Moderna running some of these trials already as well, is to develop a vaccine that is going to be able to stimulate the immune response specifically to a protein that is found within the tumor. And that's something that some people at the Weizmann are working as well. So this is a, obviously a major and a major milestone and and there has, there's a lot of hope that uh, um, mrna vaccines can be um, sort of deliver a lot of the promise here again one advantage is that these are easy to design easy to test and eventually to really give it individualized and therapy yeah. terrific uh question from stan are these pandemics a one in a hundred year phenomenon or should we be ready for more frequent occurrences what are the key learnings from this pandemic and what processes should be put in place now so we're better prepared for the future? Uh, what is Weizmann doing in this regard? Okay, so that, that, that's also a great question. So, yeah, so on one hand, that we, we, the world has been expecting one of these pandemics to hit and, and we have seen other pandemics that, such as the, the avian flu and so on happen in the past decades and, and there's good reasons to think that this can happen again. The advantages that we are seeing is, again, these different technologies such as RNA vaccines, which were not something that, that was ready for prime time uh, a decade ago. One thing that people are sort of one, there is also kind of a sense of missed opportunity in the context of this particular COVID-19, because the world has seen SARS about 15 years ago, and there has began development of vaccines and uh, therapeutics for SARS. But because SARS disappeared, there were, there were no people to test these therapeutics on. And also there was no major investment in development of therapeutics for, for SARS or for coronavirus. So there were very few labs working on that. Most of them in the East, which has experienced SARS. So there is kind of a sense of missed opportunity here. And one thing that, that is happening here, including at, at the Weizmann, is people are trying now to develop drugs that are gonna target coronaviruses, ideally sort of kind of a pan-coronavirus inhibitors. Um, so that is something that, hope that if, and again, we, we know the development of therapeutics in contrast to vaccines is not something that can happen in a year. It usually takes a longer period of time and there's certainly a lot of work uh, on that. And ideally, if we have something that's sort of pan-coronavirus, that can be helpful for some of the next pandemics as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, a question from Jan. What is the optimal time frame between first and second dose? I think this is relevant to a lot of folks on this call in Canada because our, our government has adopted a, uh, a one-dose strategy, which differs slightly from, say, the manufacturer's original recommendation. Yeah, so, so I think that it, it's worth noting that the manufacturer's recommendations were mostly based on what was tested in the trials. And the tests, the, the trials were designed to be fast. So the goal was to complete the trials as fast as possible. So it's known that the second dose should not be very early on, but uh, I think, I don't think they tested other intervals at all, but three weeks kind of in immunology is considered to be kind of a good minimal interval 
and that is why that was tested and, the, and sort of in, at least initially in many countries the response was this was the only thing that was tested this is what we should stick with even though theoretically sort of as far as immunologists were concerned they were always saying okay it's fine to wait longer in many cases uh, uh, the second dose is, can be even more effective if it's given for a longer period of time and actually a very interesting uh, um, um, study that came out uh, last week from, from Rockefeller University in the US has now looked at uh, um, the um, immune cells that the body is making, at the antibodies that are being made in the body over a course of time in people who are vaccinated. One thing they're seeing is that uh, after vaccination, but also after being infected, the body keeps improving the antibodies. So um, the, the, it's not that, that uh, you get vaccinated and then the body is producing some antibody and that's it. The body, the, the, the antibodies keep evolving and they keep getting better. So our bodies have a, a, a mechanism which enables them to, it's called sort of affinity maturation, sort of to keep maturing the antibodies and improving them as long as there is some stimulus that, it, that is making it. So this is one of the reasons that sometimes it's more, it can be even more effective to wait for longer periods of time. And if we look at, again, different countries in the world, including the, uh, the UK, much of Europe, they have waited between doses. And so far the experience seems to be that, that this is not worse. Maybe it's, it's even better. And um, again, with the only caveat being that we know that one dose does give a substantially lower protection. So the second dose dramatically boosts the levels of the antibodies. It seems that one dose was still very effective against the original strain. There is a concern now, even though that's still not really tested, that maybe one dose is not so effective against these different variants, like the Delta variant that is being talked a lot in, about now. But, um, but even one dose seems to be very effective against uh, severe disease. There is a lot of discussion now regarding sort of, again, adolescence. Um, since the second dose is sort of, on the other hand, more effective, but also has more side effects, maybe for adolescents, a single dose can be enough. But again, because this wasn't tested, it's very difficult to answer. But so far, everything seems positive about extending the period between doses. I guess that's very encouraging. Um, a question from Mike. Could you please speak to the differences between the vaccine-derived spike protein and the SARS-CoV-2 derived spike protein? Yeah, so, so, so these in generally are the same. So if we, because these RNA vaccines or the adenovirus vaccines, they eventually all hijack the, the mechanism that our body is using to produce protein. The eventual protein that is produced is, is the same and the vaccines both encode uh, virtually the whole protein. So that I think there, except for a small piece, the full protein is being made. Of course, one difference is that these vaccines are all encoding the original spike protein, whereas now uh, many of the strains that are circulating in the world are slightly different. So they, they would have uh, uh, several mutations. So this is either the strain formerly known as the British variant, but as the UK variant now called Beta or the South African, which is now called Gamma, or the Indian is now called Delta. So all of these are, are, are different. Um, and, and the vaccine manufacturers have been now testing sort of adapted versions, but so far, at least for RNA vaccines, it seems that the original strain is still giving a pretty good defense, even against these variants. It does seem that the variant vaccine is even better. So it's, it's, it's good against the variants, but it's also good against the original strain. So it's possible that this third dose that might come next year is gonna be one of these variants. But in terms of the protein itself, the protein itself is, uh, uh, is virtually the same. It's also undergoing the same kind of uh, processing steps um, that the spike protein is undergoing in the, the, the viral spike protein. Great, thank you. A question from Tiffany. Uh, could you comment on, the, on intranasal vaccines and its potential relative tradi to traditional delivery routes? Apologies, I'm not familiar with these acronyms, but it's uh, in intramuscular or subcutaneous. So under oh, the skin sure. or uh, I am is intramuscular. Uh, so there has been development of, of intranasal again for flu or something. It, it is obviously easier to deliver. There was some concern, so some thoughts early on that. So a disadvantage of kind of getting the vaccine in the muscle is that most of the antibodies that are being produced are the kind of antibodies that are typically produced in our sort of inner organs and less of the antibodies that are typically produced in, 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 different, in, in, in the nose or in different tissues that are more exposed to the virus. So this was the basis for, for the idea that maybe these vaccines are gonna be 
effective against disease or severe disease, but maybe they're not going to be effective against transmission because the antibody they, because they wouldn't produce so many of the antibodies they're typically found in the tissues that are more accessible to transmission. And so far, it seems, so again, based on empirical data in the world, it seems that they are quite effective against transmission as well, because both in Israel and in Canada, I think we've seen a very dramatic drop. So, so, so the thought is that even though it's very difficult to test how much something is protecting against transmitting to other people, but so far it seems quite, quite positive. And again, it's more complicated to produce and test these uh, uh, inhaled vaccines. I know there are companies that, that, that are working on that and don't think these vaccines are, 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 are coming soon, but they are there for, for, for the flu. So I think in a few years, we'll probably see those as well. They obviously have advantages um, and, and might have less sort of immediate uh, effects as well. Can I just jump in here for a sec? Um, we are very pleased to have um, Gilly Regev here uh, in our in our in the audience, and she is um, got a company called Sanitize. It's just passed a major milestone in the in a um, treatment, a nasal treatment. So, um, Gilly, can you share your news with us? Um, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, it was interesting you talk about intranasal vaccine, which some, some people call our treatment an intranasal vaccine, although it's not really a vaccine. It's a, it's a, a prevention and early treatment for viral infections in general, and it's based on nitric oxide, which eradicates viruses. So we've just been approved for phase three trials um, in Canada and also um, submitted the, the emergency use application to Health Canada. So we're hoping quickly to get to the market. We already have approval in Israel and um, I think start selling in Israel next week. So that's, uh, that's Actually, for- I a company from some relatives, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's for, uh, basically could be used as a daily use or every time you think you might have been exposed. And I, I know that the recent news from Israel are, are, I mean, we're doing all our manufacturing in Israel as well. And, and the, the recent use are, there's more and more growing concerns about all kinds of different viral infections, not, not just COVID. And because we were so not exposed for so long, they're a little bit concerned about the next flu season. So I think this could be helpful um, and we're going to keep collecting data as we go. Gilly, you, it's, Gilly. Exci it's exciting and sounds like the, your next trip to Israel needs to involve a visit to the Weizmann campus. There's I a lot of sure. excitement happening. We're, we're very happy for you and we're, we're following with pride. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, congratulations, Gilly. That's terrific news. Uh, so folks, we're almost up at our hour here. So I think I will just uh, select one more question here from Jamie uh, for you, Igor. Uh, so having received both AZ vaccinations and feeling grateful, learning that the U.S. will prevent us traveling to their country because the AZ AstraZeneca vaccine is not FDA approved. I'm hearing people asking the question, do we consider another vaccination that is approved once we are fully vaccinated with AstraZeneca? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. So Israel actually also now has the same dilemma. So I'm, we're beginning to admit people in, but so far people arrive, they need to be in quarantine until they get a serological test. My brother actually visited Israel, he lives in Germany. So he came in he had to do a test, wait for the result, get in. And this is obviously not something that is very, is very sustainable. So the country is now thinking about what it's gonna do next. And one idea I heard about today is to again, sort of do, I guess maybe something similar to the US and stick to, to F, because you, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is a variety of different vaccines, including some that, that were never really tested in the, in, in the West. Um, and so countries are gonna have to adopt some kind of standard. Uh, AstraZeneca, again, is a bit challenging because it has been approved very widely used in Europe in many places in the world. It's essentially the same as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is approved in the US. Um, but yeah, I guess there's a variety of reasons why the FDA has not approved it yet. In terms of getting a third dose, so as I mentioned, so far the data is that this is certainly not harmful. It has, can, it can be beneficial to some degree to get sort of an additional vaccine, perhaps after several additional months have passed uh, uh, since the second dose. Again, theoretically, there shouldn't be 
any sort of conflict between uh, between these. In terms of availability, also these RNA vaccines are expected to be uh, quite widely available. And I think I'm quite sure there is a trial in the UK trying these different combinations. But again, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, yeah, so I guess depending on what the countries will do, I, th I, th I think eventually the, the different countries are going to have to decide on, on the policy that's not based on this serological testing because it's not sustainable to test people all the time. And also these tests, they're not, they're not that great. And, and also we know that with time, the antibody levels, as I mentioned, they, they, they don't drop, but they do reduce. Uh, but the immune system has many other arms of protection. Um, yeah, so, but, but again, AstraZeneca is essentially the same vaccine. Like it's given two doses instead of one. It's the same thing as Johnson & Johnson. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the convoluted answer for that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Professor Yelitsky, for this very timely discussion. And thank you to all our participants for your wonderful questions. I apologize, we weren't able to get through all of them in the allotted time. So if you do have questions which were unanswered, or if there's anything else you're curious about, uh, we invite you to uh, please email Beth. I believe uh, included in the invitation uh, is, is Beth's email, um, which I believe is beth at weitzman.ca, but Beth can correct me if I'm wrong. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Beth uh, who's the Regional Manager of Development for Western Canada uh, to close this event. Sorry, I think you're on mute. Okay. I'm not anymore. There we go. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you so much, Igor, for sharing such fascinating research with us. It was very informative. Um, and I think we could have probably kept going for another hour. I'm sure that everybody has some great takeaways from the presentation um, and just such great insights into mRNA research and vaccines. So thanks again. And I wanna say it's really a privilege to be here today. And I wanna make a special thanks to uh, Jordan Boyd and Jordan Magidson for being such incredible leaders and ambassadors for Weizmann and for hosting and bringing us all together. Um, volunteers are really the lifeblood of any organization and we're very grateful to, to you, so thank you. Um, but the biggest thanks really goes out to all of you for, choos for choosing to share the last 60 minutes with us and asking really an insightful and great questions. And I appreciate that you made the time to hear about Weizmann today. Our campus in Israel is characterized by the joy and pursuit of science. The multidisciplinary approach at Weizmann Institute transcends traditional silos and scientists are encouraged to follow their curiosity. There's a real openness to share knowledge and embrace new ideas. And this model um, incur encourages global collaborations and includes many of the Canadian collaborations that uh, Jordan Boyd had mentioned earlier today, which um, we, if you are interested in finding out more, um, you can just uh, email me. As we know, these last 14 months have really been a very long science lesson. And one thing the world has learned is the real importance of basic scientific research. And Professor Ulitsky, thank you. Your research pr provides a really clear example that illustrates this. We could not have had a vaccine in nine months had it not been for more than two decades of basic research on messenger RNA. At Weizmann Canada, we invest in uh, discovery and recognize that with time, space, and resources, the scientists at Weizmann put hope in action and make a real global impact. We are driven by the purpose of science, which is to develop new, new knowledge and improve the world. And it really is my pleasure to talk about Weizmann. So if you are interested in finding out more um, about the research or how you can join us, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat with you. As Jordan mentioned, my um, email address is bethweitzman.ca. And I hope you will go out and share some of the, the wows from today's talk with others you'll really be helping to promote science literacy. Um, also, please follow us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, to learn more about the research and discoveries for the benefit of all humanity. Thank you once again, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye for now.